there's there's an infocom game um oh uh, i don't know if you guys are familiar with infocom games but for anyone who's no. not they were text adventures back in the 80s and they were oh, yeah. incredibly incredibly clever the most famous one is zork zork yeah. um great but they had a slightly more adult oriented one called leather goddesses of phobos <laughs> And it was utterly ridiculous, but part of what you do is you go to Mars, and at some point you get to, like, at the north or south pole of Mars, and it'll say, you can go, like, you're on the north pole, and it's going, you can go south, south, or south. <laughs> right. Where and did you're they like, get the leather? Uh, uh, good question. <laughs> I don't really remember that much about the game, but I remember that part of being on the pole and it telling you you can you can go south, and it's like, yeah, I guess I guess that's the only way you can go. <laughs> all right. Well, I retract all of the bad stuff I said about you not being a gamer because you just you just totally <laughs> redeemed yourself. <laughs> uh, Info Infocom games are the best. Yeah, I loved Zork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what were we just talking about? Well, uh, I was I was gonna say moving. yeah, I was gonna say that you, I mean you guys are saying a pole shift that the only way I can imagine this happening and maybe this is what y'all are talking about is crustal shift. Right. Like, right. I, I like, in other words, everything's the planet's still rotating as it was before, but the, like for some reason, maybe there was uh, the crust becomes decoupled from. The, yeah, yeah, the crust. Th there's maybe uh, centrifugal forces that that pull uh, the crust. You know, these northern and southern pole areas down closer to the equator. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Or if it's a changing of the plasticity of the asthenosphere or something yeah, like yeah. that right you know it causes the whole thing to shift like the skin sh right it. the shift like the skin yeah because yeah. you're right it, it, like an actual pole shift of the entire planet requires a lot of something weird. else <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a well, whole lot forces. of material all moving in the same directions and you have to change all of those directions to do that and that's very hard to do so well if uh, another planet were to yeah. hit, uh, hit us like venus Right, or at least come close enough and have a thunderbolt exchange, and then you know it could shift the. It would not only melt the ice instantly because you'd have those electrical thunderbolts, uh, but it could actually shift the planet on its axis. Right. The, that's yeah. So I agree. The the only thing that could cause that kind of shift would be energy, massive energy input the size of the planet. Right. Massive okay. external forces is what you're talking about. Yeah. And and one of the things, and Robert Schock points is Robert Schock doesn't go with the venus hypothesis robert shock thinks we were hit by massive solar flares right um but what's pointed out in some of the electric universe work and shock points it out is that you have these glyphs all over the ancient world that are plasma discharges right like that's what they are there's no yeah. doubt and and it's there's something like 30 different types and then there's five others that if you saw them in real life you would be dead and those aren't and, yeah, <laughs> and those aren't representative, but the other thirty are, which <laughs> yeah, suggests really there cool. was some kind of plasma outburst that people all over the world saw. Whether it been, you know, whether it had been Venus getting too close and these giant thunderbolts unleashing, or whether it be the sun hitting us with such a large flare, or even something cosmic that we just don't know anything about that hit us. Yeah. Yep. I, I think that that's very compelling work. I completely agree, yeah. but I do think that we could find one of the deadly ones. You know, maybe somewhere carved, and it's just like the glyph of because ah. <laughs> he must have died while carving it, right? <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah, I love it, that. It, I love the idea of the uh, of the whatever the the shaman figures and all that kind of stuff being yeah, aurora. The, the Z pinch. Or, yeah, yeah. I agree. And I'm, and and something so spectacular that yeah they're going to record that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you saw those enormous forms in the sky, what would you mm -hmm. think? And for so long, you know, people are like, "Well, this is a man with two dots on either side, and we think it represents this." And then you know, plasma scientists <laughs> looked at it and went, "Oh no, that's a plasma discharge." Yeah, that's the Z pinch guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that is that is exactly what it looks like. Yeah. Right. Yep. I think that is fascinating. And, and it, so what? You know, have they? I don't know this. Have they shown that that would that they would take those 
make uh, definite forms in the sky if there was enough energy? Because I know the auroras now are mostly bands, you know, they're, they're sort of wavy bands of light. So they have they shown that if there was enough of an energy output that they would take those? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. What would you call it? Like more... Formations? Formations, yeah. Like would we see uh, them in the sky? I, I believe so, but I mean we haven't, so we don't right, know for yeah. sure. Yeah. Let's let's hope we don't because that would not be good for us. No, it wouldn't be good. But it, it, if it did happen before, it will happen again. I think. Right. Well, I mean, if if it's a solar outburst, yeah. I mean, we are going to be hit by a massive solar flare at some point. Yeah. You know, just like the asteroid thing, just like the pandemic thing that we're dealing with now. It's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Everything you know, is we, cyclical. Everything yeah. is cyclical. So, except if it was Venus. That might have been sort of an uh, uh, outlier event that doesn't yeah. exactly happen all the time. That's yeah. yeah you're, okay, you're right. You're yeah. right. So, but that would be cyclical in galactic terms because yes. it would be caused by some object from <laughs> from the galaxy coming through the solar right. system, right? Well, I mean, there, there, there's a few different theories. I mean, I think Vel- Velikovsky went with the idea that uh, Venus Jupiter. was part of Jupiter, and something large hit Jupiter from the other side and expelled Venus from it. Right, and um, that's that's that would be the galactic part. It was some object yeah. from outside the solar system that hit Jupiter and then caused it to expel Venus, which he thought was the core or part of the core or of part Jupiter. Part of the core, yeah. yeah. And it it uh and that's what left that big red spot, the storm right. that, that is never ending because that's where Venus came out. Um and he bases that partly on mythology. When Laird yeah. Scranton did his book he found that Venus and Jupiter actually share a lot of the same gas formations, and nobody knows why. Right. And Jupiter now, has a much less dense core than they expected, and no one knows why. Right. Whereas Saturn and, has an incredibly dense core, and so you'd think that Jupiter would have an even more dense core than Saturn because it's bigger, but it doesn't. It's lost. Yeah. It seems to have lost a lot of its core. So, yeah, I agree. All that's very interesting stuff. And then and, you have the... And then you have the... the sort of deeper electric universe idea that the solar system was a very different place prior to, to 12,000 BC where Saturn was actually our sun. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's one that took me a while to, to even consider. Like <laughs> right. I still haven't, I still haven't looked at all the uh, mythological references that, um, Oh, David, uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, cause Talbot? you know, I don't remember. Yes. David Talbot yeah. put together. Um, but I mean, the idea was we were in a orbit around Saturn with Saturn was the sun, right? Saturn was the sun, and I think it was, we were with Mars, and then we came into this solar system, and Venus got ejected from Saturn at some point as as like energies exchanged and stuff. Yeah, it seems not probable, but and pretty I mean, complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah, it's a fascinating thing to think about. You know yeah. that that that. History could be that different potentially, yeah, and yeah. we don't know. You know that we were literally around a different sun at a different point in history, right? Um, but I, I have a hard time giving it too much credence without more solid evidence. Yeah, yeah. But I, I like the idea of these these massive, you know, uh, galactic or intergalactic filaments that, oh yeah, like there's there's like these nodal points in the filaments, and that's what ignites the star and caught is, mm-hmm. is causing that, that burning to happen. And then if some, for whatever reason, these, these huge forces out, you know, that are multiple galaxies in size shift for some reason, then it just puts out that star and it goes back <laughs> to being this little thing. And it, yeah, when the trail yeah. runs past another one, boom, it lights up. I think, I think that's just, <laughs> that's that is really cool. cool. Yeah, it is pretty uh, cool. <laughs> and, I don't, and when again, you, when I'm, you, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just, when I first started looking into this, the, you know, the electric universe thing, I, uh, I really like physics. I like to I like to follow all these, you know, materialist reductionist <laughs> physicists and stuff and listen to what they say and uh, <laughs> find out what the newest stuff is. And, um, when I found this, I was like, yeah, I, w- I want to check it out. And, um, I'm trying to think, I, I, I definitely looked into Halton Arp and, you know, the strange galaxies and, mm-hmm. um, Redshift problem. Wall Thornhill. Yeah. And the only problem that I have with with Wall Thornhill, I think is what everything that he says is very interesting and compelling. But I really wanted to 
get in hear him get into the nuts and bolts of like how this stuff works but he he instead will say things like well it just you know this is electricity does this and then somebody charted out the you know something about the electron and it just yeah it's it's it explains all of this but he doesn't really go into the nuts and bolts of it to tell me how you know how do mm, all these things I work uh, i want to understand it from from you know he's a physicist Mm-hmm. break it down like Feynman did with you know when he would go into detail on on uh, magnetism or some of these really strange forces that nobody understands and he would he would give you all of these sort of nuts and bolts of the how it how it interacts how it works and that's really what I would like to learn more about in this with the electric universe hypothesis I think it's cool yeah, well, it it does, and it has a lot of scientific backing as long as you're willing to look outside the accepted uh, view of things. I mean, the elect the idea of the sun as an electrical uh, sun rather than a controlled thermonuclear explosion not only works better, but it explains all the weird stuff about the sun that the thermonuclear model can't. Yeah, and I, I you know I kind of think that it's sort of both. You know, very well, maybe it, it seems to me like the, the that it's the sun is incredibly electrical, but it's also a thermonuclear explosion. I, you know, I because both of those things, when you get to that level of energy, it's all in the EM band, right? It's it's all doing electromagnetic stuff. Uh, what the what the root? I think I guess what the what the electric universe is saying is what is the root cause of a star? Yeah, and in the standard model, the root cause is gravity. Gravity, yeah. And, yeah. and in the electric universe, they're like, well, gravity is a phenomenon of electricity. Yeah. And, right. and, and so one of the things that Wall would point out is that, you know, electricity has both the repelling and attracting forces. Yes. And so it can account for gravity and also have this, you know, repulsion on the other side. Like it has a, you know, these yeah, it's two. Yeah, it got a polarity. Yes. Right? Yeah. Polarity. Mm-hmm. I want to understand that more yeah. i want to understand you know because he would say things like well you know also what was the other thing like gravity can travel at ridiculous speeds you know right. beyond How, the yeah in, in, i don't i want to understand more of that in what medium you know what are we talking about here how does it how does it work uh so well i don't think they totally know but they're seeing the effects of it is kind of how it goes yeah, yeah. and it is i and think that's fine yeah I just yeah. When, when I when I had Wall on, you know, we were talking about the binary star hypothesis, and uh, he didn't support it at all. You know, he's like, I don't think we're in a binary system. And I said, okay, but if we were in a binary system, could the electric universe theory explain how we could be in a um, sharing a gravitational point with something as far away as Sirius? And he kind of paused and he went, well, yeah, actually, it could. <laughs> Because well, that's, that's one of the big arguments: is how could we be in a binary system with, with something, something that, that far, far away. away? Yeah. Well, I mean, eh, I guess yeah, that's pretty big for a binary system. But there are star clusters that are huge. Um, mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. of course, the star cluster itself has a common center of gravity, so that's what that's what they're looking at. But I, I it might be it might be a stretch with regular gravity. You know, with the idea of regular gravity that that two stars that far away could be orbiting each other or orbiting a common center but maybe we're in a a cluster you know? that also i think that's what laird scranton has suggested that we're in a cluster rather mm-hmm. than just a binary system <clears throat> yeah um we do there there's a group called the sirius uh sirius foundation i think and the last time sirius b moved in f- between sirius a and us they they turned every instrument they had on it and one of the things they noticed is that the spin of the Earth slowed Whoa. while that happened. Mm. And that's not, I mean, what are the chances that's going to happen? You know, right when Sirius B moves in front of Sirius A, the spin of the Earth slows for a moment, which suggests some kind of connection. Coincidence yeah. takes planning. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of evidence that we're connected somehow to Sirius. And, of course, when you look at, like, the Dogon saying, well, you know, our ancestors come from Sirius. I almost wonder, again, if you look at that Golden Age type of an idea, you know, Laird, too, has shown that they, these weren't, like, necessarily extraterrestrials. They were something else. Yeah. They, they're something from somewhere else. But maybe when Sirius moves closer and we have those more, you know, intense abilities, 
we can communicate with something we normally can't. Yeah. Right. That idea is really cool. That too. is really cool. That. And all this, this quote unquote spiritual communications that happen now are attempts of those same beings to try to communicate with us, even though we're kind of out of the golden age, right? Not, right. Right. Don't have the ability anymore. We're wandering around in the dark and they're, they're trying to get our attention. Right. So, you know, this is all, be, I, I loved, I, I think I've uh, wanted to ask you this, so I don't, maybe I have before, but you, You've done a lot of shows on the Yuga cycles, mm-hmm. and one of my qu- yeah, one of my questions about it is if there is a golden age and we're all like uh, people are incredibly advanced and we all know what's going on. Why would you let yourself fall back out of it? You see what I'm saying? I, I don't think that's something you can stop. I mean, but but if you could leave, oh. Like leave the planet? Yeah, get out of the system oh, well, that's causing. Well, right? Maybe they did. Yeah, I. I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's also possible that we're so tied to the planet that we can't leave. Well, that's that's a sad idea. I don't like that idea. <laughs> it, it it is, but it's entirely possible. I mean, when when people go out into space, they immediately start having health issues. Yeah. I mean, we we haven't sent someone as far as Mars yet, but I mean, it might be that we're tied to our star somehow. Yeah, you know, we know the we know the sun affects us, but if we tried to leave the solar system, who knows what effect that might have on us? Right. I agree that there are that, that it does stuff to people when they go to space. Um, but is it health issues relative to them coming back to Earth? Like, would they be fine if they stayed in space? Right. Right. Yeah. And uh, well, what, what was it with the twins there? That what was it the? Uh, oh, I know it starts with a T. Yeah, they the got telemeters. longer telemeters. Yeah, yeah, and they were they got longer when he was in space, right? Which means you can live longer. Telomeres. <laughs> yeah, we call those space genes. Space genes. The space <laughs> genes were activated. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought they said it didn't really make any difference. It's just that it was an effect. Yeah, I mean, telomeres are the things that supposedly regulate aging. So right. Right. I don't. I don't see how you can just be like, well, it didn't really have an effect on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, I guess we'll know if one dies at you know sixty five and the other lives to a hundred. Right. Right. Or if one mm. continues to look, you know, in his thirties when the other one's looking in his fifties or whatever. Right. So, so then the next market will be sending people to space so they can look younger. Yeah. It, I mean, wouldn't that be crazy if just going to space for a while would actually be a, a sort of a, you know, a fountain of youth? But, but we've or also maybe- had people. People in the you know International Space Station for long periods of time, and, and there doesn't seem to be any health benefit to it. Well, health benefit relative to coming back to Earth is what I mean. Yeah. But like, it may take decades for it to manifest. Maybe. Maybe who knows? You know, I mean, we don't know enough about the human genome yet to know that that guy. It was more than just telomeres got changed. They they said that all kinds of stuff was happening in his genes that they didn't understand. Really? Whole, I didn't know whole that. Whole sections of his genetics were being, quote-unquote, activated is what they said that, that, you know, are normally not. So it was like, hmm. it, it, and that may just be, you know, I don't know enough about genetics to say what's going on, but it sounded to me like his body was responding to being in this vastly different environment because he was right. there for so long, right? So that's, well, and I think, that, I think that's what the end result was, is they were saying it was just a response to, it was a normal change to the environment. Yeah, normal. Space is not normal. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i'm saying is like it, the longer people stay up there the more interesting it will get because we'll yeah. we'll know more and more now this was a twin experiment and they were specifically watching to see so now they know what to look for so people who stay up in space for long periods of time they can come back down and be like well man you know your space genes got turned on <laughs> 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 And what does that even mean? You know, it's it's an interesting idea like this. We're going back to maybe us coming from Mars or whatever. Like, well, why do we even have space genes that get turned on? Yeah, yeah. Now, and, you know, and it, could be, it could be because just, just being in a vastly different environment activates genes, and that's how genetics works. Uh, yeah, and, that, is, and that would kind of make sense in terms of, like, the development of life on, on this planet. Yeah. Right? Like, let's say... We fi- we actually do go and colonize some other planet. It may be the same situation for being on another planet as it is for being in space. But it may look like, let's say we go and we colonize some planet, and very rapidly after being on that planet, our you know through the generations, our genes start changing, and we go through this sort of quote unquote evolution. Yeah, 
that that changes us to match that environment a little better. It mm-hmm. makes us adapt to that environment. Yeah, we can't really run that experiment here because we're all we're all already adapted to this one. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, you you you're a reader of sci-fi, right? Am I remembering yeah. that correctly? Yeah. He's a, do you read any Niven? Do you read Larry Niven? No. Uh, okay. I have some books from him. I haven't read them. Yeah, he's most famous for the Ringworld series. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But he had this fascinating idea uh, in his, you know, a lot of these old authors, they did this, the, what they call a future history, where they basically start telling the, the future but it's but you can read them in consecutive order, even though there are a bunch of different stories about different people. There's all the sort of set in the same universe, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So he had this he had this idea that at some point humans would decide, well, let's we're we're advanced enough to we're interested in colonizing other planets of other star systems. So the first thing they do is they send out a bunch of probes to these to these nearby star systems that they think have the possibility of having exoplanets, and the probes are programmed. To find a planet with that that's habitable, right? So the probes go out to all these different places, and some of them send signals back. Yes, this pl- there's a planet here in this system that's habitable. So the human race builds all these enormous, you know, the one way generational ships where everybody's get put into cryo sleep and they send the ships off. And this is a one way trip, and you're mm-hmm. so thousands of people get into the ship they get put into sleep and then the ship goes off and it takes hundreds and hundreds of years to arrive at the star system and everybody wakes up and now you have to colonize this planet and it isn't until after they start arriving at these places that they figure out that there was like an error in the code of the probes that the probe was just programmed to find a habitable point right Mm. it didn't it didn't (laughs) so in other words if it found a planet where there was one spot that was habitable to humans it would say yep come here <laughs> oh man <laughs> so they end and of course all these people went on these one-way di- trips right so you can't go back so they have to colonize them so they end up colonizing all these crazy planets that have one area where you can like one of them is is a moon of a jovian planet and the moon is so close to the planet that's pulled into an egg shape okay and at the poles it's it's the the uh, the poles actually stick out of the atmosphere and, huh. and the because <laughs> it's pulled into this egg shape, so the poles stick out of the atmosphere. The equatorial band is crazy storms and clouds all the time, and the only place you can live is in between those two, right? Interesting. And there's another place where the the planet is is got a very dense atmosphere, but there's one gigantic, enormous mountain that sticks out up into the habitable area of the atmosphere, and that's where everybody has to live on that mountain, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So what ends up? Later on, like, and I'm I'm going through this whole long thing because of what Kyle was talking about, is that everybody sort of adapts to that. So you end up with these people that you can tell wh- which one of these colonies they're from because of what they look like, because of the area. Oh, right, they- yeah. So mm. the people that landed on that moon that has, uh, you know, the that moon that I was talking about that's egg-shaped, it has three times the gravity of Earth. So all those guys are like dwarves. They're short and very wide, you know, because they when you're born there, it, you want to be three feet tall and four feet wide because, <laughs> because the gravity is three times Earth, right? And then there are people that are born on planets that have much less gravity, and they're very tall and thin, but they're all human. So, very interesting science fiction Dan, stories. Uh, uh, Dan Simmons' Hyperion series is kind of like that, where he has small, stocky, strong people yeah. coming from a planet that has he- heavier gravity. Yes, exactly. Um, the other show that does that really well is The Expanse, um, because they have people who are born in space, and these people can't come back to Earth. Right. Yeah. I just started watching that, actually, in like four or five episodes. Oh, in. cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's really good, and it's more, I think, accurate to what actual space travel would be like than anything I've seen. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think that's true, that in, those, in a lot of those old science fiction stories i used to read the people that ended up you know they called them the belters or whatever they worked in the asteroid belt yeah they couldn't come mm-hmm. to earth and they didn't want to they they were like why would i want to live down in a in a hole yeah, that's what that's, they call the planets that's what they call them in uh expanse in the belters, expanse they yeah. call them the belters yeah i wonder what was the author that was yeah. niven okay i wonder if the whole show is made after niven's could be uh stories yeah and- the belters and do not want to live down in a hole that's what they talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, if you think about it as a gravity well, it is a kind of hole. 
Yeah. So nope. The Expanse is written by James S. A. Corey. Okay. He has uh, three books of it. I don't know. It's a whole series. But I mean, let's be honest. If you had like a single ship that had a fusion drive, or so, you can't go light speed or whatever. But if you could jet around the asteroid belt looking for weird metals and stuff, wouldn't you do it? I mean, wouldn't you? I spend <laughs> the rest of my life doing that. That sounds like a blast, you know, exploring <laughs> weird potatoes in space. <laughs> so, so there, there, there is a podcast called Empty, and unfortunately, they don't really update it very often. Um, but there was a very interesting concept to start it off. So these people are launched to another solar system, whatever. And they're put in cryogenic sleep for however many hundreds of years. But they're realizing that before those people get there, they're going to have light speed travel. Oh, yeah. So, so more than likely. So they're sending these people off. And then at the same time, those people are expecting to wake up and have people already at their destination <laughs> right. who got there quicker. And have built everything um, already. <laughs> right. Um, so that that's kind of an interesting concept, you know, to, to be put into that cryogenic sleep and then wake up and be like, oh, you didn't need to do that. Of course, you wouldn't have still been alive by the time that stuff was perfected anyway, but right. it, it, it's a weird sort of like... <laughs> or you get there and there's no one there. And then well, you're like, in, what happened? So, so in this series, they wake up and everything is gone. Like the planets and stuff are still there, but there is no sign of life anywhere. Hence the title empty. Like the universe literally is empty of life. Oh. And they're it. They're trying to figure out what happened and if there's anyone else out there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And the machines are all turning against them. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's really good, but there's only like, I think maybe six or seven episodes, and then they just kind of like, oh, and that's the end of season one, and it took them forever to get those first like seven episodes out, but they're well done. Yeah. So it's it's worth a listen. It's just don't don't expect it to be updated anytime soon. So many uh, podcasts just stop, you know, and I, I don't yeah. know if it's they don't get enough behind them or what, but they'll have some interesting story, and then it's just done. Yeah. You know? I tried that. I tried diving into some fiction podcasts and I just, that's why I couldn't do it because they, they would just, uh, they would either, they'd be really fascinating and then they would just kind of peter out or they would just stop updating or it would end yeah. at a not ending and there was there, no there explanation. Was, there, there was a good one. Uh, they literally le released one episode and it was like a, a bigger studio doing it, you know, because now studios are realizing oh, hey, you know, podcasting seems to be popular. We should do that, too. So they get, you know, big stars in to do these these yeah. podcasts. And um, there was only, I usually I don't listen to those because I'm kind of like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but there was there, there was one, let's see if I can find the name of it here. Um, I have so many, because I save all the podcasts in case, you know, someday they disappear. I still have them all. Right. Um, I don't remember which one it was, but it was, it was really well done. It was. It almost seemed like it was going in the direction of like Event Horizon. Ah, uh, yeah. And it was like one episode, and I went, "Okay, I'm totally into this. Let's let's you know, let's go. When's the next episode?" And this was like last October, and I look at it, it's like next episode will be August. Yeah. I'm like, but there was no next episode. They said they had six done, and they'd huh. be releasing these six episodes, and they've never come out. Wow. Maybe they got a movie deal. <laughs> I don't know. You and you go to the website and they're posting stuff like normal, like oh, here's the first episode. Hey, look at this stuff that's happening, but they're not talking about where the episodes are. And I even wow. tweeted at them. I'm like, where's where's the rest of your episodes? No response. I'm like, uh, what the hell. Stick with where did the but, road go and brothers of the servant people. <laughs> I will I will tell you if you want a good science science fiction podcast, <laughs> listen to Wolf three fifty nine. Okay, I'll check that it one is, out. It is it is complete. It is a story from beginning to end. They ended it. Um, it has a view of alien life like nothing I've seen before. Uh. And it starts off kind of silly. And as it gets going, it gets more and more um, dark. Like they, they kind of get their, their, their balance between some comedy stuff and dark stuff at the same time. Yeah. So like you got to go through the first few episodes which are, you know, like when I first started listening to them, I'm like, I don't know, this is almost too silly. And then after like the fourth or fifth episode, I'm like, okay, now it's getting good. <laughs> <laughs> so 
that seems it, to be a thing. Like you know, they they kind of are goofy at the beginning because they're not sure. You know, yeah. but then as they go, they're like, no, this is this is good, and we can still have comedy in here, but let's get serious. Yeah, and empty had six episodes. I just pulled that envelope open. <clears throat> Cool. Um, but uh, like I said, it's a great concept. Some of these things have fantastic concepts. Yeah. I mean, the the idea with Wolf 359 is you have this this space station, and I don't want to give too much away, so it basically starts with them picking up this uh, this signal that's uh, classical music, uh, you know, and they're thinking it's coming from Earth because they're way out there orbiting the star Wolf 359. And they're like, oh, you know, it's an old signal from Earth, but then at some point they realize it's not coming from Earth. It's coming from a different direction entirely. Mm. And they're going, wait, is someone feeding this back to us? Yeah. And that's where the whole thing kind of starts. I love that kind of stuff. <clears throat> I, where, uh, how much time we got here? Because I have another that <clears throat> reminds me of a subject I was going to ask you about. Eh, five or ten minutes. Starting okay. Life on, like, searching for life. Oh, no. I was going to ask him about the long delay echoes. But, yeah, oh, okay. we do need to talk about that. We, we we could do part as a Patreon as well. Have you have you okay? So this is about the you know. Have you looked into long delay echoes at all? I'm not sure the problem of long delay echoes. Okay, so when they were first kind of getting radio going, you know, so we're talking mm-hmm. when they were first experimenting with radio, there was this interesting phenomenon, and it still happens. Um, people keep track of it, but there's this interesting phenomenon that they called. LDEs are long delay echoes, right? So radio waves are, okay. uh, they're a form of light. So they move at light speed. Okay. So if, if you know, I, I'm sure some people have used, you know, like a, a CB or whatever, and you, you'll hear people talk and you kind of hear like this, this reverb on their voice. Like you're hearing it multiple times, but they're real close to each other. Uh, and that can be various atmospheric phenomena but basically light can circle the planet a, a, you know a beam of light can circle earth seven times in a second okay so if all the conditions are right and and some of these like the, some of these uh you know ham radio is designed to bounce off the stratosphere so it stays on the planet so it will circle mm-hmm. it so that's why at night sometimes people can talk to people from the other side of the planet you know you can if this all the conditions are right you can pick up people from very very far away on ham radios um so, like I said, light can circle the planet multiple times, and it's seven times a second. So sometimes you'll get this, you know, you can you, if you hear an echo, <clears throat> and it's and and there, there's a there's a half a second delay between the between what you initially hear and then the echo you hear. Well, it had to bounce off of something mm-hmm. for you to hear that echo. And if it's a half a second delay, it went out for a quarter of a second, hit something, and came back. Right. Now, a quarter of a second in light speed is a long way. <laughs> mm-hmm. Light goes 186,000 miles a second, right? So when long de- the problem of long delay echoes was how are we getting how are people hearing these echoes that sometimes were seconds long? What was it bouncing off of? It had yeah. to be going out into deep space to come back. And uh, so there's a whole, and it's never really been solved. I mean, people have tried to explain it as being a function of solar stuff, uh, other, you know, but there's not really a good explanation oh. for these long delay echoes. And it's I have heard of it, and I don't know that much about it. Yeah. Other, other than what you basically said, that we don't know why that happens. Right. There's, there's a whole, you know, I mean, there's a whole long conspiracy that you can go into about the Black Knight satellite and it possibly being, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because what reminded me of it is you were saying it, 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 in this science fiction story, they were like, is somebody bouncing this back at us? Yeah. 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 So. Well, and the Black Knight satellite is one of those things like John, the first I came across that was John Keel writing about it. And his basic th- thing was that it was a satellite we were picking up. That was moving. That was that was kind of looked like it was observing the satellites we were putting up, and it was moving on a polar orbit. Yeah, and and then it just kind of disappeared. But then you have people, you know, pulling up pictures off the space shuttle, going, "Is this the Black Knight satellite?" <laughs> yeah. And I'm kind of like, I don't think so. I think whatever that was was something different. Yeah, and whatever it was was able to leave orbit, which is weird. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, and we couldn't do polar orbits at that point, so we know it's not us necessarily, right? And it was too um, big, uh, you know. They mm-hmm. tried to they calculated its mass at the time, and it was way bigger than anything we or the Russians could have put up there. So the 
the other thing is like when you have uh, the old accounts of people looking at Mars and seeing canals. Right. And th this was, you know, confirmed over and over again. But if you look at Mars now, you don't see canals. Right. That is very strange. It's like, so what happened on the, f on the face of Mars that may have looked like canals that has changed? Yeah. And I mean, what do you think of the, uh, have you looked into the, I'm sure you have the whole, um, what is it? The Russian probe that got, that just went dead right after it saw. Oh yeah. yeah. Anomalous stuff right there by Phobos. <laughs> yep. Yep. It, it's approaching Mars and you see that white streak and then it, the streak seems to stop right in front of it. Yes. And then it's just gone. Yeah. And they literally, and, and Russia literally said our, our probe just got shot down by a UFO. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's not it's not inaccurate. It was an unidentified flying object. Right. It doesn't mean it was manned, but right. uh, I think Hoagland suggested it was an ancient security system. Yeah. You know, on Phobos, they're saying Phobos has some weird stuff on it, too. Uh, Phobos has a very large tower. Yes. Yep. That you the, don't see normally in nature. Right. The obelisk of Phobos. Yeah. <laughs> and there's other weird stuff in the solar system, like the Death Star moon. Yep, that one is a very strange. It's, you know, no moon. That's no moon. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. It's, you look at that it, and you're just like, okay, that that large of an impact should have destroyed that thing. It's mm -hmm. so strange. And and I do believe the EU had an explanation that involved it moving too close to Saturn or something like that. Yeah. I mean, I guess but I, I guess there could have been an impact that big, you know, I just don't know. It seems like it it's so enormous it should have but the fact that it looked like the Death Star with the trend, the, the wall running all the way around it instead of a trench and then that being almost in the same position, it's just like, yeah. what are the chances of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, Lucas was telling an old story in a new way. <laughs> are, are we creating the reality around us before we discover it? Right. Now, that's a whole other rabbit hole. Like that gets into yeah. that, that oh, book yeah. about the Titanic and all that stuff. Right? I hope not. Cause I don't want many worlds to be true. I'm <laughs> totally biased. Why? <laughs> what do you got against it? I just don't, I, I think it's a, it seems like a cop out really. Mm. You okay. know, we're, we're mm. trying, we are trying to understand the universe around us. So because there are all these mysteries that don't seem to make sense, we just make up an infinite number of universes that make ours probable. Yeah. Hmm. It's, it is I, a cop out. It's, it is, it's kind of like, you know, the dark matter and dark energy. It's just like a kind of a cop what, out. But, <laughs> but what if the multi-world theory, uh, folds more around consciousness than like randomness? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they, but that's not what they're, that's not what they're talking about. They're observing, uh, you know, the the tiniest particles that you know we've been able to observe, and they're they're basing something off of um, probability calculations, and yeah. and so they're just saying, well, every single of the tiniest building blocks of everything can be both one way or the other or, and and actually will be both right and each time right. It each happens. time it splits the entire universe of all the other particles into <laughs> its own i mean i'm just i don't know yeah it, to me it's um uh, it's like i i realize that i'm biased right i i'm fascinated by physics until we get there and then i'm like for some reason that strikes me as that's not beautiful like every other aspect of physics and and the existence of the universe is. I agree. It makes it a giant mess. It, you know, it's just an infinite number of universes where it basically everything has to happen because all possibilities are right, taken. Right. right. So, so the fact that we live in this universe where we see these patterns such as like phi, you know, the golden ratio exhibited all over the place and in life and, in every, you know, like that's just – happenstance that it's one of the you know infinite number of universes that don't have that pattern no nah, it's just because we're in a computer simulation <laughs> also and boring, also there, <laughs> also there, boring. And, and 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 also there's only one electron just one just one <laughs> it, it's it just repeats it, it just keeps showing up throughout time <laughs> <laughs> every electron is the single same electron it's the same one doing everything yeah. okay. I, I so so yeah i'm 
I just don't like it, and I realize that I don't like it because of totally because of a bias. I mean, it's not. <laughs> I just don't like it. It's boring well, we're at, to me. We're out of time, but let's. You, you guys want to hang out and do a short Patreons thing? Absolutely. Sure. Um, let's end. Uh, first of all, where can people find you? Our podcast is called Brothers of the Serpent and can be found anywhere podcasts can be found. And we also have a website, brothersoftheserpent.com. And you can email us at brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. That's right. Send us, All right. send us questions and trolling. We love it. <laughs> Where Did the Road Go is made possible in part by our awesome patrons. And for those of you pledging $10 or more, an extra special thanks. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Tim, Stone Wilderness, Luke Osborne, Rob Drummond, Alex Whitcomb, Nadine, Damian Tallman, Edu Camahort, Tactical Therapist, Janet Bunderson, 36 Dingo, Maria, Jennifer Campbell, American Rambler, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster, Eric Citron, Andy McNamara, Sasha Yorg, Matthias Sunby, James Lattimore, Sam Sheeran, Dominic O'Malley, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Ray Benedetto, Linz Jackson K., Alfred Tuttle, Kevin Schreck, Patricia Gaiaquinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris is a hot dog a sandwich, and Carla Mahoney. Thank you all so very much. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons. And we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange.